Right, hello everybody. I think we're going to make a start. Um, I just want to apologize on behalf of Rose. She can't be with us today because she got a really nasty call. So you're stuck with me. Just me today. Um, so we always begin with a prayer to say Lucy, and since we have Father Daniel here today, I think we can, if you say it, I can say it, yes. Please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O St. Lucy, you prefer to let your eyes be torn out instead of denying the faith and defining your soul. And God, through an extraordinary miracle, replaced them with another pair of sound and perfect eyes to reward your virtue and faith, appointing you as the protector against eye diseases. I come to you to protect my eyesight and to heal the illness in my eyes. O St. Lucy, Preserve the light of my eyes, so that I may see the beauties of creation, the glow of the sun, the colour of the flowers, and the smile of children. Preserve also the eyes of my soul, the faith, through which I can know my God, understand his teachings, recognise his love for me, and never miss the road that leads me to where you, St. Lucy, can be found, in the company of the angels and sinners. St. Lucy, protect my eyes and preserve my faith. Amen. Amen. So, in previous sessions we have touched on a variety of topics and for today we decided to go back to basics a little bit and um, ask ourselves how do we read a painting. So reading a painting is a little bit like reading a book in the sense that there is um, a, a topic there is a genre, there is a subject, there are some characters. This is, at least in most paintings, if we don't count abstract art, for example. Um, but all of these elements are comprised in one single image, as opposed to a, a full narrative over however many pages um, a book has, depending. So, but I, I would say everyone in this room has um, some understanding of visual art, however big or little it may be. Maybe because as children we were dragged around a museum against our will, <laughs> or, or not against our will, <laughs> um, or we are long-time aficionados, or we are experts. I really hope there is no, there, there aren't any experts here. Um, <laughs> and or we are starting to get into it now. Um, but we've all been to a museum or a gallery or an exhibition of some sort and maybe we've come up to a painting which has caught our attention for some reason but we don't quite know why maybe we don't even like it but it's sort of we feel attracted to it um, or maybe we sort of had an idea in our minds because we had seen it online or in a book and then you actually see the real thing and you're disappointed. This happened to me with the Mona Lisa. Like, when I saw the real thing, I was like, why? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> or it was beautiful, but we didn't really see the point or why it was made. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about how to, um, what, what elements we have to sort of read on a painting and to analyze it. Um, this topic is very long and complex, so we've just sort of selected a few points that uh, you can take with you and if you want next time you go to a gallery or you're in front of a painting or even just a, a work of art, but mainly a painting, um, you can reflect on them. So, um, I'm just going to put them all together <laughs> in here. So, we, we've got the, we, if we go from the outside to the inside, so we would have the frame, which is obviously the physical frame of the painting, but you can also think about the frame as the different frames in which the figures or objects are um, inserted within the painting. Then the composition is the arrangement of the elements within a work of art. So how the parts of the image relate to one another to make a whole. Um, and composition determines and is determined by the other things on the list. At least until not very long ago, just like 
more or less mid-20th century. Um, the style is um, the category, or well, the period that a painting um, belongs to, but more than the period is the, the category that traditionally art historians have um, sort of decided that that particular work of art belongs to. Because all these categorizations are sort of are made by us, are made by art historians, and obviously they, they, they respond to certain criteria, but they're not always exact. Um, but if you think, for example, Renaissance or medieval, or in the 20th century, you think of all the isms, romanticism, impressionism, post-impressionism, um, then form is the element of shape, so how things are portrayed. And this has a lot to do with the style. So depending on which period, depending on which movement, artistic movement or artistic current we are in, we will be seeing the same subjects or the same objects represented in different ways. Then, obviously, the color. The subject is what is represented. It's not to be confused with the story, that's the narrative, that's what's happening, but what is represented, which could be figurative, as in people or animals, it could be objects, a still life, it could be a landscape, it could be abstract painting. Then the narrative is what is happening, so is the story. And obviously this wouldn't, um, this wouldn't apply to abstract painting, but this is only if we compare it to the, all the other, like, many centuries of history of art, abstract painting is only a small part of it. Um, and then, finally, allegory and symbolism. So these are elements of a painting that have a deeper meaning that catches the eye. And the painting can have some symbolic elements, uh, or none, or be completely allegorical, as, as we'll see. So the frame, actually the, the transitions is something that Rose put on and I didn't know how to take off. So, <laughs> so um, the frame is, is interesting because um, how, a painting is, oops, how a painting is framed can tell us a lot about the context about the, the, the country, about how society uh, was doing, about the economy, about politics. And the study of picture frames is a rather new discipline. And the, because the histo historic frames have always been the poor cousins of big paintings. You, you look at the painting, you don't look at the frame. But sometimes when you actually look at the frame, you realize that there's such variety and some of them are absolutely incredible. Some are even better than the paintings they frame. Um, but then in the modern era, um, by, by this I mean post-medieval, um, the original frames were usually discarded. Uh, when the painting changed owner, the original frame would just be discarded because it didn't match the tastes of the time. So they would substitute it with a different frame, which for us now is also valuable, but the, the problem is that um, the vast majority of original frames has been lost for this reason. Um, so frames are very tied to, for example, to architecture and to taste in interior design. Um, and it was only in the late 19th century when the um, art historians started to get interested in studying the frames as well as the paintings. Um, but it, it, it's not only about architecture or taste in interior design, but also the materials, for example. So depending on the region of Europe, let's say, you might use a different type of wood that is not available in other countries. So that's something that a frame can te tell you about the provenance of a of a painting, or the specific techniques or habits of different workshops that might be very unique from a certain location or a certain period. I found, I found an article that's quite interesting, and I think when we um, post the recording on YouTube, I'm going to leave a list of like, just links to articles that I've been finding whilst, whilst doing the, the presentation. So as an example, we've brought you this um, um, altarpiece by Raphael. 
it's, uh, it's in the Metropolitan Museum now, but it was originally painted for the Franciscan Convent of Sant'Antonio in Perugia, in Italy. This is a very early um, work by Raphael. So it was painted in 1504, and it was in that convent until 1678. And in that date, the nuns sold the, the painting. Well, you can see in the reconstruction here, so this is only the central painting and the lunette above, but all this, I'm, I'm not sure where these others are, I'm not sure if maybe some of them are lost, or if, if they are still with us, <laughs> there'll be in other museums probably. Um, but yeah, so the nuns, um, the nuns sold the altarpiece in different pieces, and the original frame was lost. Then it, it had different frames in the Metropolitan Museum, so that's the, the one that it had since it came to the museum, that was 1916 until 1936. As you can see, that is very sort of Baroque, Rococo style. It's very, it's very busy with all the grotesque de decoration. Then from 1936 to the 1970s, it had this one, which sort of matches better a painting that a Renaissance painting. So it's more, it's more, um, it's, it's more Renaissance sort of like it's like a neoclassical sort of style. And the current frame is this one. It's just that the columns have been removed. So if we go back, is the, is this one? So I'm actually not sure if this frame is an, a historical frame or it was specifically made. For the for this painting, but the, it's quite nice that the, the um, pilasters have the blue, and it sort of brings the blue from the background sort of forward. So it kind of it matches the painting much better than, for example, this one, which sort of makes your eyes sort of go get lost a little bit in so much decoration, and it changes the mood of the of the work quite a lot. Then the composition, so. So you can see that um, that phrase by uh, Pierre Bonnard is a well, well composed painting is half done. So in, traditionally in, in Western art, composition is what brings together all these, the, the elements are within the image. It's a, it's a harmonious relationship um, that is satisfactory to the artist as well as to the viewer. So it's a bit like a piece of music as well. And there are some dominant elements, which are the protagonists, and others as the supporting roles. I had to make a cinematic reference. I just, I just can't help myself. If you know me, you know that I'm a bit obsessed with cinema. So, and the these elements are all laid out according to us to certain principles. So just to enunciate them. So the the elements that you can um, look at are line shape, form, the color that we will see later, the texture, the value, and the space. And these are laid out according to a series of principles, which can be, again, there's too many to talk about them. They can be scale, proportion, unity, rhythm. Again, space can also be a principle, perspective, depth. So it's complex to achieve that harmony, but, um, but the composition has many uses. It can serve to um, create a, a specific mood, or it can serve the narrative. Um, and we are going to look at just a few things, because like I said, this composition is the most, is the most complex one to talk about. So I decided to go for perspective, which as you can see there is creating a three-dimensional feeling out of a two-dimensional image, basically, uh, to give that illusion of depth that our eye needs to, to be able to make out like a, a real image, to, to think that we are looking at something that's real. So um, there's different types of perspective, but the two main ones are linear perspective, which is in the one in which the lines um, direct to a vanishing point, and that's where your eye is directed to. And as the object draw near, 
to the vanishing point, the smaller and the less detailed they will be. The ones that are in the form forefront will be much more detailed. Uh, an, artwork, an artwork or a painting can have one vanishing point, it can have two, it can have three, it can have multiple ones. Tintoretto uses one, it's, it's off center, but you can see like all the lines on the floor direct to the vanishing point, just there. And this is the table, the, the seats, even the, the leg of this disciple, I can how the other one is pulling back, everything directs her eye to the vanishing point. So that's linear perspective. And then we have aerial perspective or atmospheric perspective. So this one um, is the one that Leonardo used as uh, sort of, he was the, the one that used it, maybe not for the first time, but for the first time as continually used it and set it as the, as the, the most popular one, because it was more, if you like, it's more naturalistic, it's more realistic. Because in the other one, it's a bit, obvious if you like what Tintoretto is doing with all the, the lines is going there. Whereas in this, for example, it shows the effect of the atmosphere in your composition. So the objects that are in the foreground are full of details, the colors are more vivid. And as you go further in the distance, it's like there's further details and there's the, the areas, the distant areas look a bit sort of foggy. So, and the, co the colors become lighter and more, it, it has um, even like a, like a blue, bluish tone. In this case, this is sort of diminished a little bit because there is a sunset and that makes the background of the image more red. But normally, it's quite, even if you look at the, it's not, it's not, it's really great quality in here. Now when I see it here, it's not great. But if you look at the building, like this building is more crisp it has much more detail than this one. This one, and again, it's, it's much more clear on the, on the laptop, but you see, it's sort of, it has like a haze, like you can't quite of make, make out the details on it. So, and this is a much more naturalistic, if you say, way of, of achieving perspective. And then another um, tool, if you, if you like, is the use of compositional maps. So compositional maps are just tools or techniques that make the main subjects of the painting stand out from the rest, from those ones in the supporting roles or and for the, from the background. And they capture the viewer's eye and lead it to the focal point, to the vanishing point. And there are a multitude of these. One of the uh, most basic ones and the easiest ones is the triangle. So the triangle, is has always been regarded as like a perfect shape um, because it allows you for a balanced, perfectly balanced composition. So it directs the eye from one point of the triangle to the other in a sort of like a continuous flow. And it eliminates distractions. You kind of, you concentrate on what you're, you don't, you're, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily aware that you're doing this, but your eye is doing this. And it allows the eye to focus on the main subjects with great ease. It's a very strong shape. It holds all the elements together. There's nothing that's sort of coming out. And a painting can have one triangle, two, three, four. So in this case, you see there's like two main triangles. This, I chose this painting because I'm going to talk about a few different compositional maps, a few different tools within the same painting, because it's quite easy, because it just has background and then two big groups of figures. So you can see the two triangles, are slightly different, but two triangles in there. Then you have the rule of thirds. So basically, if you divide your canvas by thirds, both horizontally and vertically, you have a grid. This is like in the, in the camera, George reminded me of this. I hadn't actually realized, oh yes, this is what happens to the camera. So the four points where the horizontal and the vertical lines intersect is where you want to have your focal points, is where you want to have your subjects. They're the best, say the best points to have your subject because the, the eye will be directed to them. So you can see, for example, in these two, so we have our lady's head very close to this point, the center of 
this group is at this point, uh, the center of the Christ's group is at this point, and this point is the only one with a, a bit empty there. But generally, so, um, Solimena has, has um, followed the rule of thirds. Another one is the, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this, <laughs> chiastic. chiastic, thank you, chiastic structure. So, um, chiastic comes from the Greek letter chi, okay, um, which is written like an X. And it's a literary figure in which the main ideas of a sentence are sort of mirrored. So it would be something like A, B, B, A, but not necessarily repeated exactly, but it would be A, B, B plus A plus. So there's a slight variation. And visually it works the same. So if you get like the two main diagonals of the painting, and this is diagonal A, and this is B. So it would be A, B, B, A. So, and this has to do as well with the balance of positive and negative space. So positive space is the main focus of your painting, is where you have your subject. Negative space is the background. So it's not a blank space, but it's the background space that um, serves as a support to the object in focus and helps to bring it closer to you, uh, not closer to you, but like bring it more sort of um, to accentuate the, the presence of that object. So the balance is very obvious in this one because it's negative space, um, mass, mass, negative space. So again, it's A, B, B, A, but it's not exactly the same because obviously here we have like the groups are not exactly the same. They're not completely symmetrical. They're not, they're not completely exactly the same and the postures of Christ and Our Lady are not exactly the same. But if we take a step further into this, so the diagonal A would divide the composition between the becoming glorified of Our Lady and the fully glorified of heaven where Christ is. And diagonal B would be the one that carries the narrative of the painting, because she is being assum assumpted, assumpted. <laughs> she is literally assumed, assumed thank you. Uh, so she's going towards Christ, so it's not static, she is moving, there's a, there's a sense of movement. And then there is the golden ratio. I don't know if you've heard about this, um, I was, last night I was like, do I explain the whole thing? Do I not explain the whole thing? Because actually it's, it is complex and like for me even, like because it's a mathematical thing and I'm not a numbers person, it's, it is complex. Um, so you might have heard of it. Uh, so the golden ratio is basically a proportion of one to one sixteen, one to one point one six one eight, if I'm correct. <laughs> You have this proportion in the golden rectangle, which is this one here, but not only this one here, this is also a golden rectangle. This is also a golden rectangle. That's a golden rectangle, that one and that one and that one. So each golden rectangle as it gets bigger, it, it doesn't change in its proportion. And that's why it's called golden, because it's like sort of the perfect um, it's considered the perfect, harm, most harmonious relationship between visual elements. And the golden rectangle is also contained in the golden spiral, which, again, I found an article that explained how to draw your own golden spiral, and I was like, come on, I can't do this, like, I'm not a maths person. It's so easy and it's, it's great, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave the link on the... Um... Irene, yes. isn't it a bit like going from, say, A3 to A4 to A5? If you just fold a piece of paper, you will still end up yeah. in the same proportion. Yeah. So, so yeah. You know, from here... Yeah. I guess it's the same idea, isn't it, George? It I'm just I'm just referring to the ma mathematic okay. husband. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. It's the same, it's basically the same idea. So it has been called the, the sort of the basis of our perception of beauty, and it was widely used by artists throughout 
history of arts, but it's also, as you may know, present in nature, it's absolutely everywhere. And then uh, the idea of this idea of the composition as the adjustment of the relationships of the, the elements of the work within the border of the canvas, so within the frame of, of the painting, remained unchallenged even through the early avant-garde movements like cubism, like even abstract art. But it was in the late 1940s when Jackson Pollock, the American um, expressionist painter, abstract expressionist painter, he introduced what he called the all-over composition, which is basically all over the place. Um, and the traditional composition became the, um, called the relational composition, like alluding to those relations between the, the elements. But still, Pollock generally keeps his motifs sort of within the frame of the painting. Then Barnett Newman, went a little bit further by doing these, uh, sort of juxtaposing this, these blocks of color that run off the top and bottom of the canvas. And he deliberately left his canvases unframed to sort of give, that, give this idea that if, if you wanted, you could continue those blocks of colors, of color ad infinitum, basically. They, they didn't have a beginning, they had no end. And it, it wasn't until the late 50s that this artist, Frank Stella, a British artist, um, he created a composition that was both all over the place, because there's no obvious <laughs> relationship between the different elements of the picture, um, but also broke out of the confines of the canvas. So this is aluminium and oil paint. So this actually comes off, it's almost a relief. It's not exactly a relief, but it's almost, it's almost like a collage. Not quite like a collage, but it's, it's very similar. So he was the one who sort of took the, the idea to the, to the extreme. Right, we're done with composition. I was a bit worried about this. So style, um, like I said, style is that categorization that art historians have traditionally given to the different periods. Of, the, of, of art, of the history of art. Um, so we generally, when we see a painting, we say, oh yeah, oh this is Impressionist, or oh yeah, this is medieval. We generally start with the style that it belongs to. But the reality is much more complex. Is ca any categorization is flawed, because for example, I think this is a very clear example, post-Impressionism is nothing. It literally is anybody who was painting during a certain period of time after the Impressionists. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything in particular. It doesn't um, pinpoint a particular style. If you take Cezanne and you take Van Gogh, their styles have absolutely nothing to do with each other. They're both classified as post-Impressionist painters, but each of them had a very particular style. So that's, that's just one, one example. Uh, but even medieval art, I mean, medieval art is like, you don't, you're not really saying much other than more or less the period in which it was made, which is already quite a big period. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of, that's a way of, of describing it, a, a distinctive manner which permits the grouping of works into related categories. Because we have to relate, we have to relate works to a certain category. It helps us to order our knowledge and looking for connections between artists and, and artistic movements. But it evolves over time. Um, so like, like I said, is the shape, for example, the form will change, but my, the subject might be the same. And that has to do with the style and the taste and the, the period. So as an example, um, we're bringing you two versions of the same theme, the birth of Venus. So Venus, as you may know, is the, the classical Roman, Greek and Roman ideal of the female form and beauty. So this is Sandra Botticelli's, um, probably the most famous version of this subject, is Renaissance. And just a few points for you to look at. So you see the figure of Venus is in contrapposto. This comes from classical sculpture, and it literally means like being off-center, so in your posture, so that 
your hips and your shoulders are sort of opposed to each other. So this shoulder is higher than this one, this hip is higher than this one, so it's kind of opposed to each other. Um, so that comes from classical sculpture. It's a bit the same idea as the chiastic structure, like it's the, the hips and the shoulders are opposed to each other. And the position of the hands comes also from classical sculpture, is this um, sort of this theme of Venus uh, called the Venus Pudica um, that is trying to cover her body, He's, she's trying to be modest. And this uh, links in a way with the Catholic idea of, of modesty, um, meaning that her face, uh, which is, she's looking at us directly, her face and the soul, uh, her soul are more important than, than her body. But the figure itself is closer to Gothic art than it is to nature, really, because the if you look at the curve and if you look at the posture, she's not even standing, she's almost floating on that shell. And the posture would be impossible to hold. Like if you if you try to put that posture on, you're going to fall <laughs> over. Um, her shoulders sort of flow down to the arms, like they're not really defined. And she's the, thing, the, the reason why her posture is impossible is because this foot is almost completely lifted and the way she's leaning towards the other foot is like she's going to lose her balance. Um, and also some features, um, sorry about this, but some features like her breast, for example, are very, it's very spherical. They're not naturalistic. They're almost like geometric figures. Um, so and the, so the, and the proportions and the poses of the other characters don't even make much sense. I mean, that was going on with those legs. Uh, so also, they none of them cast any shadow. If you, I ha actually had never thought about this before. I've seen these painting loads of times. I had never, it had never clicked in my head that they don't cast a shadow. Uh, obviously, we are within the realms of the divine. We're in front of our goddess. These two are uh, god and, um, and goddess as well. This is also not a goddess, but she's uh, one of the hours, so she's a divine creature as well. So we are in the divine realm. We are not in the real world. And therefore, Botticelli, in general, he wasn't interested in depicting reality. He wanted to depict idealized beauty, and this is what idealized beauty looked like for him. Because, again, Renaissance, Botticelli had a very personal style. Nobody paints like Botticelli, so this is his personal style. And I can tell you her gaze is absolutely hypnotic in real life. I don't know, have, have any of you, of you seen this painting in real life in Florence? Where, sorry, where is it's, the, it's in the Uffizi in Florence. I, it blew my mind, like how, like how beautiful her face is. It's just you sort of. I could just stay there forever looking at her. It's just is really so. It's so beautiful. This is, by contrast, a version by Bouguereau, which is a French painter of late 19th century. And the ideas of female form and beauty are quite different. So, it's still idealized beauty but with photographic quality. And you have to think, at this time, late 19th century, photogra um, photography is starting to become popular and is starting to sort of say, oh, well, we can depict reality. Actually, we can't do that. We don't need painting anymore. So painters now had to compete with photography. So if you see, like, her skin is hyper-realistic, her hair is incredible, it's each of the hairs is painted like with the light sort of shining on them is 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 insane um so and you you can see the forms of her body are even if she's still idealized she's still very beautiful but she looks more normal <laughs> she looks more natural her breasts are slightly either flatter they just look real it's not comprised to just shapes of circles or, or triangles or a rectangle they, there's not this sort of curved shape of the body even though she is in a sharper even sharper contrapposto than the other one but her posture is definitely real she definitely has a weight um, she's not floating you can even see like like a bit like of 
just fat here. So it's, it's, it's very, it's much more realistic. So the academic painting in the 19th century sort of nodded to classical forms as well, but it wanted to be more, more, more closer to the real world. The form um, is the, the shapes we can see. So it's, it's the element of shape among the various elements that make up our work. And until the emergent of, emergence of modern art, when uh, the color became sort of the rival of, of shape, of, of, of form, form was the most important element in a painting, and color came after. And it was based above all on the human body. But in modern, in modern art, so beginning of le late, well, second, second half of the 19th century, uh, the idea grew that form could be expressive even if it was largely or completely divorced from the appearance. So, and the idea played an important part in the development of abstract art. So, for example, I've sort of I'm giving you a sequence of modern paintings that show the progressive, that progressive divorce between form and appearance. So you have Degas um, ballerina here, so you can still recognize the ballerina, definitely. I mean, if you come really close to it, you see it's basically uh, an amalgamation of just brush strokes. Like, the, he's, he's not, he hasn't like defined every single shape with the um, with the pastel with the pencil and then colored in he's creating the shape with the color and that's part of what the impressionists were trying to do but you can still recognize the shape very clearly it's a ballerina it's a person she's dancing she's doing this movement here we have other ballerinas because you can see some legs there you can see the I assume be the teacher um and some i don't know what that even is so that that sort of is not important for, for what the guy is trying to depict. This is called Le Toiles, it's the star. So we all have to be focused on the star of the show, who is her. We don't care about anything else. Then this one is uh, Henri Matisse. So you can see the, the shape, actually the shape here is, if you like, more defined than in Degas, but it's getting more and more synthetic. It's, is human form, you can tell that they're human, but they're not very naturalistic, are they? Um, so they, again, they, they sort of, it's interesting how sort of uh, paint, like art history of representation of the human body sort of goes on a, um, goes up the hill and then comes down. Like it was all about achieving realism until it became, they, they got to a point when it was impossible to get more hyper-realistic and then they, they just sort of went, not down, but it, they went almost backwards to, to sort of take off what they considered that was superfluous to go back to the most basic shapes, the most basic forms, and that's what Matisse is, is doing here. And then here we have this uh, British artist, David Bomberg, she's called a dancer. That's why I've, I've brought you dance, dance, dance. So it's, it's just a single dancer and it's still not completely abstract. Like you can sort of make out the head, you can make out the body. Not sure if the arm is supposed to be here or there, but. I think this is a leg that's sort of, that she's sitting on the floor and she has her leg up like that. That's how I see it. I'm not sure if, he has the, if, if, if it's the case, but that's how I see it. So it's not completely, completely abstract, but it's pretty much in that direction. So um, this is in the Tate Modern, but it's, it's not on display. So um, unless there's an exhibition, I guess we can't, we can't see it in, in real life. But. Um, this artist said in the, in the same year that he painted this, he wrote, I appeal to a sense of form. Where I use naturalistic form, I have stripped it of all irrelevant matter. My object is the construction of pure form. So that's what he was, he was sort of on the way 
to achieving. Now, color. So the first cave artists uh, created the first pigments out of uh, a combination of soil, of animal fat, of burnt charcoal and chalk around 40,000 40, years ago. So they had a basic palette of five colors, so red, yellow, brown, black and white. So color is uh, used in a variety of ways. It can be used to create a certain mood, to achieve more realism, to serve the narrative by guiding the eye towards the focal points, like we've seen before, like to create perspective as well, um, to make the image more harmonious. Um, in the eye, for example, I'm going to go back really quickly to this. So, like the white and the white, the blue and the blue is sort of, it brings the image together, it helps you, it helps your eye, it helps your mind to sort of make sense of it and hold it together. And also it can express the contrast of light and shadow, this is very, um, very important in the Baroque period with all the Caravaggio and his, and his followers with the chiaroscuro. And, and also to, um, of course, to serve as a symbol, color is very symbolic, as we're going to, to see in a, in a minute. And sometimes the story behind a color is, is fascinating. So I'm going to show you one of my favorite paintings ever, <laughs> which was in this room, not the painting, a uh, reproduction <laughs> of the painting. And then it disappeared, and I was really sad about it. Uh, so this is the Virgin in Prayer by Sasso Ferrato. I just love the just the gentleness of it the 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 silence i mean to, for me this this conveys just silent prayer and there's nothing else there's just our lady and you there and god that's it and the color is the most important element in this painting firstly because the background is completely neutral it's not completely black, but it's almost black, and it brings the figure towards us. It makes, makes it sort of 3D, um, almost, and it is, it's, very strongly, it's very strongly lit. Um, and the, uh, so she looks almost like a sculpture, also because of her, her skin is so, so white, it's so pale, and it's almost like porcelain. But it's also the sharp contrast of light and shadow that makes it sort of come come out of the canvas towards us and this is also achieved with contrast of color um, we feel as if we, we were in the same room as her and this makes sense because this is a devotional painting this is meant to be for private prayer it's not meant for a church it's meant for a I actually don't know who commissioned this but it, it was for a devotional purpose um, and then if we look at the garments, it's just three colors in the white, red, and blue. So white, again, we, we uh, said that color can be very symbolic. So white, purity, red, the passion of, of Christ that she shares into. And blue is the color of heaven. And it's of this, this blue that I wanted to to talk about. It's probably the most obvious color to, to talk about, but um, uh, this, this blue is called ultramarine blue and is made from lapis lazuli, it's, uh, in, which means stone from the sky or stone from, from heaven. It's a semi-precious stone. It's, it was mined in the northeastern um, mountain range of Afgan Afghanistan, and it was the most expensive of, pi of pigments. It was more expensive than gold. And in the European market, it only um, became popular, it only came uh, through Venice in the 1200s. So it, it was a sign of, again, it's, it's a symbol of heaven, but to people, for example, who uh, came to uh, the private house of the owner of this, he would say, well, that's ultramarine blue. And then his visitors would be like, <laughs> like this was, uh, as well as for private prayer, this was to show off. Because if you want this, just 
in your private chapel and you don't want to show it to anybody, you don't use ultramarine blue for that because you're not stupid. You're not going to spend that much money for just you to see this painting. You want to show it to people. So it has that double meaning. Um, the blue in, in the, within the, the context of the painting signifies that Our Lady is somehow otherworldly because it's the color of heaven. So it's touching on the mystery of Immaculate Conception at the same time as saying that she's a human being. So it's sort of talking about uniting the impossible, like how, how God and man can come together. And yeah, so we see the different uses of color in this image. We see the symbolic use, we see the perspective use, uh, and the realism through the contrast of light and, and shadow, and, but also the mood. Like to me, this painting invites me to just be quiet and reflect and pray. And also the narrative, obviously, because it's a devotional painting. Then the subject is probably the most sort of straightforward, is the what in a work of art. So there's, there's the topic, is the, is the focus, is the, the image. Um, most common subjects, we have people, being history painting or portraits. We have objects, <laughs> like a still life. We have the natural world in landscapes, seascapes, and we have abstract abstractions. It's not to be confused with the narrative, as I said before, narrative is the story that's happening, that was going on. So just as a, just a few examples. So we have this still life by Chardin. He was this artist renowned for his still life paintings in the 18th century France. If you don't know Chardin, I fully recommend you to check him out. It's absolutely amazing. I didn't know him. A few years ago, I didn't know him. And I went to an exhibition. I think it was in the Thyssen Museum in Madrid with my parents. And I was completely blown away by the still lives. I mean, still lives is not something, it's not a genre that's like the most spectacular of all, but to me, he's the absolute master. He's, he's absolutely incredible. Um, so you can see, just to point out some things, so you see it's a, it's a collection of, well, it's a juxta juxtaposition of two different shapes. You have the spheres in the, in the apples and the pears, and you have the, the mug, the cylinder. So I'm not sure if this was a commission or if it was an exercise. It could have been an exercise very well, because this is the kind of thing that you have to draw and you have to paint when you go to art school and you want to get in and you are <laughs> doing the exam. So, um, yes, yeah, so you see the fruit is quite ripe. We can tell it's, it's, it's quite ripe. So it, it sort of it's, can be also a symbol of, of life. Um, again, we see the contrast of light and shadow with the, the, the light shining on there. And we see that um, something that's called trompe, trompe l'oeil. I don't know if you have a word in English. We have a word in Spanish. We call it trompe d'oeil. Trompe d'oeil, okay, so yeah. Did you say trompe d'oeil? Yeah, yeah yes. more or less, yeah. I tried to sound more French, but I'm sure Severin can say it better. <laughs> so you see it in the knife sort of coming, coming out mm -hmm. at us. That's a very, that's a very common uh, resource in, in still life. Uh, painters wanted to make them real, wanted to make uh, the illusion that there is no canvas, that you just can reach and grab one of those apples or grab the, the knife. Then we have this uh, rug picker by Manet. I actually didn't know this painting before. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting because it's, it's sort of, um, is the, represents a modern portrait. It's not an important person, it's, it's a nobody is the equivalent of today's homeless man pushing a shopping cart. Um, and in, in the 1860s, Manet made a, a whole series of pictures of street characters that he found around the neighborhood in where his studio was. And this, this is the, probably the most well known. Um, in, uh, in French, it's called the, the chiffonnier, mm -hmm. I think. So he, he salvages rags from the garbage to, for sale to paper manufacturers. So that's what he's doing, that's what he's doing with the, with the stick. And if you, it, it, he's kind of a, an emblem of 19th century Paris. There was uh, sort of this city which was growing almost uncontrollably. And, and these people are the people that the city were 
was leaving behind, really. But if you look at the rubbish at his feet, it's almost a still life. It's a still life, bless you. It's a still life that uh, has been left to rot. But is the, the, the thing that contextualizes the figure, with, if you take this out, you don't know what this, what, what this person is or who it is. If you put the rubbish in, then it gives it context. And this is uh, the snail by Matisse. Now, can you see a snail in there? <laughs> I mean, again, it's sort of up, it is abstract, but we still have this, the shape, so this would be the bottom of the snail and this would be the shell. So these sort of concentric circle going on, of shapes going on here are supposed to mimic the, the shell of the snail. So um, the reason why Matisse, <laughs> she's like, nope. <laughs> so the reason why he um, did these sort of paintings towards the end of his life was because um, he was quite ill and he was bedridden, so he couldn't paint anymore. So, but he produced a number of these, uh, these works, which were called gouache de coupé. So it's, they're made by cutting or tearing shapes from paper, which had been paint, previously painted with gouache, um, placed and pasted then by an assistant. He couldn't even do it himself, but he told the assistant where exactly to paste the piece of paper. And Matisse uh, said of this technique, it allows me to draw in the color. It is a simplification. Instead of drawing the outline and then putting the color inside it, I draw straight into the color, which is quite an interesting idea. So yeah, you can still make out the shape more or less, especially of the shell because of the, the circle. Um, but he said, I first, I first drew the snail from nature holding it. I became aware of an unrolling. I found an image in my mind purified of the shell, and then I took the scissors. And that's, that's what came out. So he has also combined pairs of complementary colors, so the red with the green, the orange with the blue, and the yellow with the, with the mauve. So, and that is another use of color by putting complementary colors together, and this is something that comes from the Impressionists. It gives you an impression of more realistic an image. Not in this case because this is abstract painting, but it makes it somehow more pleasing to the eye. It, it, even if it looks like it's got complete random selection of colors, it's not random at all. And then the narrative is obviously the story, if there is one. Like, obviously in the snail, there is no story, like, it's a snail. If, if you see a snail, and if you don't see a snail, then there's a group of, of colors there. Um, but in the Western art uh, until the 20th century has mainly been narrative. And it would be, the, the topics would be, or the stories going on would be normally familiar to people. And it would be also a sign of education and of social status. If you were well educated, you would know your mythology. So modern art got rid of the narrative, um, although it coded references to political issues or social issues were still present. So I could have brought you a historical or a mythological painting, but we went for something more obscure. So this is called the fortune teller. So you see that five quite eccentrically um, dressed figures here. This is a very innocent young man who is having his fortune told by this old lady, and he's surrounded by these uh, pretty young ladies here. One, he's sort of eyeing this one, and she's eyeing him, but he's not realizing that this one is picking his pocket. So it, it, it's sort of a weird subject for a painting. It's like, what, what is this? But actually, the subject of the gypsy fortune teller and the, the young man, the innocent young man, was very common in Europe uh, in the 16th and the 17th centuries. It was quite typical um, of Caravaggio. Actually, Caravaggio did a few, uh, painted two canvases with this topic. And, um, but it, it was something that was also circulated in prints as well. So it was kind of 
be careful with this sort of thing because this would happen in real life. I mean, it can happen even now. Um, and th there could be ties to the story of the prodigal son. There could be, but it's not, it's not obvious. Like, he, there, there could be a biblical meaning behind it, but there could also be not. And finally, is allegory and symbolism. So the, the subject of the artwork, or, or some elements in the, in the artwork, are used to symbolize a deeper moral or spiritual meaning. It can be anything. It can be food, it can be color, as we've seen. It can be certain clothing, it can be the season, it can be the time of day, anything. And we brought you this allegory of the Catholic faith to finish by Vermeer, uh, it, this painting, so it was painting at a moment when public celebrations of mass in the Dutch Republic were forbidden. Uh, and it draws on the complex language of allegory to depict the triumph of the Catholic faith, but without it being too obvious. So Vermeer, I had no idea about this actually, he converted to Catholicism before his marriage. And this painting, which includes a table with a chalice, a crucifix, and was probably a missal more than a Bible because it's supposed to be the altar, so it's more likely a missal, um, may refer to the celebration of the mass in the hidden churches, in the private chapels of, of private homes, a bit like St. Mara Clitheroe would do. But, um, and the choice um, and interpretation of the imagery would included here would have been discussed between Vermeer and the patron. So the patron would have a very clear idea of what he wanted for the painting. And also they had to be careful, obviously, to, to not be too, too obvious. So um, there was a book by an author called Cesare Ripa, which is called Iconologia, and this had uh, a lot to do with, with what objects could symbolize in art. So Vermeer is likely to have uh, drawn on from from this for for this painting so the woman represents the catholic church she's wearing white and blue so again purity and heaven she has uh she has the hand her hand off on her heart she uh, has her right foot on top of a globe so symbolizing the triumph of of the faith on the on the world this here, so I don't know if you see it very well, but this here is a stone crushing a snake. And this is supposed to be the cornerstone of the church, which is Christ crushing Satan. Uh, there's an apple here which has been beaten into, so that's obviously the original sin. The glass sphere, um, is, it was a popular decorative curiosity at that time, but in this context it may also be viewed as a symbol of heaven or of God. Obviously we've, we've mentioned the table as the, would be at the altar, and the crucifixion scene at the back, in the background, is based on a painting by uh, the Flemish artist Jacob Jordaens that Vermeer had in his collection, because uh, apart from an artist he was also a collector. And then the curtain sort of invites us into this private space in the home, but also in the private space of our heart, of our mind, where faith is as well. Um, and yeah, the room could very well be depicting one of those private chapels. As we see marble floors, it's quite a rich building. The empty chair is quite puzzling. It's like, is that an invitation to go in there, for the, for the viewer to go in there? I don't know. And that's it for today. I've managed to keep it to an hour. So, don't know if you have any questions. <laughs> Pressing questions. We are going to, just before I forget, we are going to um, leave you also on the YouTube, maybe, um, or on the newsletter, maybe it's better, just to give you our email addresses. So, if you have any questions afterwards, or if you have any suggestions for topics, please feel free, because it's a bit like awkward sometimes to ask you after the talk, do you have any ideas, do you have any questions? And sometimes it's a bit like, oh, no, 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 So, you know, in um, the quiet of your home. So yes. Am I right in thinking that Henri Matisse also, uh, his, his art was at least transposed into stained glass? 
at the end of his life. And he did some design for stained glass. I actually didn't know that, yeah, but it... There's a chapter. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that, so right, I'm going to right check right that out. Oh, okay, okay. And it seemed to me to record the... the, the yeah. The image of the snail seemed in some ways to connect with it's, that. Yeah, it's the same idea, blocks isn't it? Because it's blocks of basically stained glass, it's basically yeah. blocks yeah. of, yeah. of coloured glass, yeah. so it's, it's the same idea. He just found different ways to to express himself. It was a bit like, um, I think it was Monet, that he had, I think it was Parkinson, and he couldn't quite... Well, Mo um, Monet also had eyes, really serious eye, yeah. eyesight problems. I think he had yeah. a cataract. Yeah, but he um, he would tie the, the the brushes to his hands so that he wouldn't drop it. So it's yeah, it's 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 really lovely. For example, in the case of Matisse, how an artist loves his art so much, loves to create so much that they just find new ways of mm. of doing it. So mm. yeah. Can I just ask about the rat tail? Yes. You show three different frames, none of which is yeah. the frame in which it was framed, as we saw. Yeah. So are we to understand there's now a fourth frame? So the the frame, let me let me go back to that one. The frame that we see, the first the one. The second one. Yeah. Let me see. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Come on. Is this oh. transit? There we go. So. Actually, not, this, so this one... It's not any of those three, though, is it? This one is the one I has now. So it's been framed four times. But the, this one is the same one. It's just that the columns have been removed. Mm -hmm. It's because oh, right. it's a black and white image. It, it's a bit oh, difficult right. to see, because I thought it was a different one, but it's not. It's the same one. It's just well, it is very close, but now you've explained it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's... it's yeah, it looks completely different with the columns there, but yeah, it's the same one. It's just that the, the columns were just in front of the pilasters. What's the technical term for the little pictures underneath the, the ones that have disappeared? Ooh. Is that predella? A predella? A predella. Is, is it the same in English? It's because I, I wouldn't know the technical... No, predella. Oh, predella, predella, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's the same as in Spanish, yeah. Yeah. No worries. Are you happy, Father? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a shame that Rose couldn't be here, but anyway, she'll be here next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Shall we close then? Okay. Thank you, George, for the.